Coming up on Tech Thing, FBI cracks iPhone, Logitech's conference cam, Alexa for Pi, finding sites you've signed up for, and pick Stormtrooper armor, and yes, the Odroid C2 is fast, all coming up on Tech Thing. If you get something useful out of this episode of Tech Thing, please consider contributing to the show at patreon.com slash techthing. We're brought to you by viewers just like you. Thank you so much. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Patty Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we make technology behave. At least on the good days. I hope it's a good day. It is a good day. You didn't bring in any sicknesses? I should put that into context. Everyone in my house <laughs> except for me is sick right now. I feel so bad for them. I hope everybody feels, feels better soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah it's, it's, yeah, it's basically like one kid has a flu, one kid has a sore throat, and Aww. is coughing, and my wife has a stomach virus. <laughs> well, don't share it with me, and we'll, yes. we'll be good. I've stopped exhaling <laughs> here at the office. So we should talk a little bit about some news that just released yesterday. Apparently, yes. the DOJ found a way to get around Apple and actually unlock that well, San Bernardino, uh, the killer's phone. I don't know if they got around iPhone. Apple, but they got around, okay, so, so you know, San Bernardino killer, iPhone encrypted, yeah. password is entered, uh, and, and the FBI is like, okay, Apple, we need you to create a special version of your operating system that will allow us. In Everybody info. knows the story by yeah. now. <laughs> okay, well, you know, but there's there's so much misinformation around it. Oh yeah, there right? is. And because because basically, trust me, you start l studying this stuff for like ThreatWire, and you're like, but this website said this, and then this one's saying right. something completely different. Yeah, journalism that doesn't even count the sort of ideas that are being passed around on Facebook because yeah. everybody thinks before they types on Facebook or or when they condense things to 140 characters on, on Twitter. Not that I'm questioning Twitter or Facebook I've as a legitimate that. source of information, but there's moments <laughs> where you're just like, that word, it does not mean what you think it means or that, <laughs> that technical concept. So in any case, the FBI is like, we want infinite guesses. And infinite guess, it sounds like a lot, yes. right? But the reality is, is like the four digit code is, is roughly 1600 combinations or something. Mm -hmm. And you can get through those on an Android device in an automated fashion in a matter of a couple of days. Yeah. Couple of days. So here's the thing, like all we know is, is the FBI is like, we found a way in. Right. We'd like you to vacate the order. So the, yes. the, the, they're dropping their case. The, Don't know how they found the way in. A right. lot of people have conspiracy th theories thinking of NAND flashing or right. NAND memory. Talked um, about that no on threat wire last week. But yeah, it's the idea is the, 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 the lead theory is basically like you yank the chip, you copy the information, the image, the chip, you put the chip back on, they guess until it gets wiped, they pull the chip off, they put the information back on, um, or huh. some sort of automated version of that. Um, the other big rumor that's floating around is that as soon as the FBI was presented by one of their consultants or consulting organizations yeah. or security groups that had an idea, that they immediately classified it. Oh. Um, I don't know if the FBI can classify surprise, things. Surprise. Still, but well, yeah. Well, I'm sure Apple wants to know. Well, it's, you know, there's, I'm sure Apple wants to know, <laughs> but this also gets back to something we've been running into with the NSA, with foreign governments. Um, you know, there is a large market for what we call zero days, right? Yes. What, what's a zero day? Well, okay, I found a way in. I found a hole. I found a security flaw. I found a problem. Mm -hmm. um, I can use it myself. I can tell the manufacturer, you have this hole in your system, right? And that's, right. for example, why, you know, there's, there's two theories of why, okay, so Google has upped the, 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 the finder's fee for bugs in the Chrome operating system. Yeah. Um, they've like doubled it. And there's two theories on that. It's like, one, they're like, we're so badass, we're not getting the attention we need. Let's make a huge reward so that somebody will start hacking on this operating system. The other alternative theory is like they know somebody has an exploit and they're trying to get them to ex share the exploit mm -hmm. so they, they keep upping the amount of money or they up the amount of money once. They double the amount of money they're offering for, for bugs. I bring this up is because, you know, Three-letter government agencies have been known to buy zero-day flaws because they wanted to hack into things without the general public noticing, right? Or if you are a nefarious criminal, you might pay for a zero-day flaw because it's going to allow you to attack all the things until that flaw is patched. And in the process of attacking all the things, you will make a whole bunch of money or get a whole bunch of passwords or whatever it is you're looking for. So, yeah. I'm sure Apple does want to know. Mm -hmm. Like, who knows? Maybe there's back channels of communication where somebody sidles over to like Apple's. Let's say Apple's lobbyist, because Apple spends a lot of money on in in, in DC. But 
<laughs> then flash. Well, we you know, know you guys aren't here just specifically to hear about security and privacy news all day. You could probably watch Hack 5 for that. But uh, we will be discussing this further on ThreatWire yeah. tomorrow, which is at uh, threatwire.net. So moving on. It's a big deal. It is a very big deal. It's you a know. huge deal. And, Apple's and like, we could do an entire show on it. Okay. <laughs> Are you saying just let it go? For She's now. She's saying let it go. <laughs> we could talk about it over lunch. How's that? <laughs> Mark writes, could you demo how to set up a Raspberry Pi to run on an Amazon Echo? Thanks from Mark. Ironically, I can't at the moment. What? It's true. Is it, this why you text everybody at like 10 p.m. last night? Well, actually, it was actually like 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we have a... Yeah, Slack and, 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 and Google Hangouts are not necessarily <laughs> the most efficient forms of communication. So if you go up to GitHub, mm -hmm. um, Alexa AVS Raspberry Pi, uh, people are writing about it everywhere on the internet because it's pretty crazy. Um, this is cool. This is cool. Um, what you're looking at right there is something I need, which is a USB microphone. <laughs> I have thrown out every USB microphone, every cheap microphone I own, <laughs> gone from my <laughs> Apparently life. Apparently everybody in the office has too. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I, I have to order on Amazon, basically waiting for a USB mic to show up uh, from Amazon. Um, because the only USB microphone adapters I still have uh, require a driver. And it's really hard to call Alexa without a mic. Yeah, yeah. I can understand how that would be complicated. But this is really <laughs> cool. You do, you know, it's it's not, it, is, it isn't always listening in the same way that your Amazon Echo That's is. That's nice. Um, or, or irritating, because like if you have to be like, Alexa, make me a sandwich, instead of, you know, being across the house and being, Alexa, make, oh, sorry, I'm doing the Alexa. That actually was not <laughs> intentional. I'd like to apologize, at least I'm not ordering detergent on your Alexa. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting, it's, it's cool. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I just, I, you know, I, I'm torn between like Amazon being like, eh, let's make it so everybody can do it. And eh, you know, this is another <laughs> stream of data we can use to, to <laughs> capture information. And now we know exactly what you want to buy every single day. Maybe it really is listening. I'm kidding. Because <laughs> uh, that'll get into a large and bizarre security conf for cons. Conf <laughs> So speaking about Linux boxes. Conversation. I want to shout out to Andrew for the heads up on Ameridroid. So uh, Andrew emailed us a little frustrated. He uses uh, uh, Odroids uh, in his workplace um, because of the increased throughput. So this is Ameridroid. If you don't want to order from Korea and pay $16 for shipping and wait an indefinite amount of time for an Odroid to show up from Korea, um, you can go to Ameridroid, which is their US distributor. and. Basically, for 42 bucks plus shipping, you can get an Odroid C2. Cool. Uh, I actually chose one uh, with the two amp power adapter. So you can either plug in an external power adapter, or you know, like a dedicated power pinpoint power adapter, or you can use uh, uh, power it over the OTG jack. I also ordered a case because I'm at the point of my life where I'm really tired of breaking innocent boards because <laughs> they're rattling around inside of my bag and that gets expensive. <laughs> The other thing Andrew wanted me to be very clear about is that Hard Kernel does provide Ubuntu and Android downloads that are ready to roll. A full Ubuntu download and an Android uh, installer. Um, we were talking about you know, how with the, the Odroid, there's not a huge amount of, of support. There's yeah, not thousands of It's not a big community. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There's not, if, you are going to, if you're going to build your own project, you're going to be rolling it yourself, although there's some pretty cool ones yeah. showing up on Hackaday. Um, the other thing that's pretty crazy, uh, we've talked about uh, Jeff Geerling before. Um, he did the benchmarks on the Raspberry Pi and demonstrated that different brands of, even if they were the same class of yeah. micro SD card, different micro SD cards were much, some were much faster than the others. Yeah. So his kind of project for Raspberry Pi is the Raspberry Pi Dramble, which is Drupal 8 on a cluster of Raspberry Pis, uh, which is really crazy. That's um, cool. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. So he's a little <laughs> obsessed with uh, I.O. on Raspberry Pis and has done a ton of benchmarks. So he got the Odroid C2 in, and what you're looking at right now is the Odroid C2's gigabit versus wow. the, uh, that's the Orange Pi Plus, and that's the 10100 that is on the shared USB bus on the Raspberry Pi 3. So the Odroid C2's gigabit Ethernet on its own dedicated bus is not quite three times as fast, uh, okay. 938 megabits per second. Uh, and he also did his crazy Drupal tests. Uh, the Odroid 2 uh, C2 does consume a fair amount uh, more uh, uh, electricity, more juice in certain circumstances, but his Drupal benchmarks were 36% faster. Wow. Uh, on the anonymous versions uh, versus the Raspberry Pi 3 and the Odroid C2. 
uh, about 25% faster when he was doing authenticated uh, Drupal benchmarks. Wow. So yeah, there's a little bit of a... Of a That's a slight increase in speeds. <laughs> yeah, and well, the other thing he, he notes is, is we talked about a little bit, uh, is the optional uh, EMMC card. So you can use an EMMC card instead of a micro SD card, which should give you significantly increased throughput. Very cool. Um, so I'm ordering an EMMC card. Okay, yeah, power's not quite double uh, th when the Odroid is maxed up, but mm -hmm. like about 800 milliwatts, which okay. is not a huge amount of electricity. Um, assuming milliamps, not milliwatts. I don't know <laughs> what a milliwatt is <laughs> in this particular situation. Um, Hackaday's got a great list of Odroid projects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the thing about the Odroid is if, if you want to learn to Linux, don't worry about waiting for Raspberry Pi 3, get an Odroid. If you do not want to learn all of the cool things about Linux that make you a Linux user slash super user, um, the Odroid's probably not the best for you. But the performance, especially if you're doing server-based or network-based stuff, stomps the Raspberry Pi 3. Hopefully, this ends any confusion. Better <laughs> community on Raspberry Pi 3, way better performance on the Odroid C2, in, especially in terms of networking throughput. And also, if you're like me, you could just dual boot Linux on your computer. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> you're, a Linux, you're, you're, you're well on your way to Linux super useriness. Oh, I'm past there. You're past Linux super Oh, yeah. User? I know all those command, command line things. You I can know. write my own bash script. <laughs> <laughs> I can. It's awesome. I know how to alias. I'll, OK, never mind. <laughs> I won't get into it. <laughs> Proud Linux user. Mm -hmm. So when are you going to give up Windows? Um, I was actually thinking about doing that with my next laptop, since this one is Acer's. <laughs> I don't want to destroy it too much. <laughs> they'll want it back eventually. It. Well, <laughs> just wipe it and reinstall Windows when you're done. Come on, That's go, true. I could. Go full-time Android. I could. I want to be the I'm last person I'm waiting until the, the next long-term long -term support, which is, I think comes out in April. So much excitement. I know, right? Everybody loves when the new long-term support version of Ubuntu comes out, especially us. AskTechThing.com if you got a question. By the way, is anybody on Steam? Mm. Let me know. Okay, you hear that? That's silence. That's the sound of Tech Thing without Patreon.com slash Tech Thing. People like you, ladies and gentlemen, make Tech Thing possible by crowdfunding. A little bit from here, a little bit from there, a whole bunch of people working together. You can donate however much you want per episode. But if you do, not only are you making Tech Thing possible, you get access to our special patron-only builds and uh, access to Shannon and I at certain levels on a monthly hangout. If you can't donate, we understand. No worries. Please. Take your time to send us questions, tips, and to share the show with your friends and family. If you got time to give our video the thumbs up on YouTube or like in our Facebook page, it all helps us to keep Tech Thing growing. It makes it possible for us to keep Tech Thing coming to you. Something useful in every show. That's our goal, people. Thank you so much for supporting Tech Thing, no matter how you do. Three questions answered, three reviews, three picks, all in three minutes. <laughs> this week's Rapid Fire Roundup is three podcasting, podcasting, podcasting. Podcast <laughs> Podcasting. <laughs> I should have drank more coffee, people. <laughs> Three podcasting apps for Android. At BFaze on Twitter. Ask at TechThing. Any chance of reviewing the top podcasting apps for Pound Android and my new S7 Edge in a future episode? Why, yes. Yes, there is. <laughs> Are you ready? I'm ready. In three, two, one. Go! The first one is called Pocket Cast. You can... Whoa. Be quiet, you. The first one is called Pocket Cast. You can find it over at Google Play. It's $3.99, and it's my personal favorite for a lot of reasons. So first off, they have this really nice sync fe feature. So if you create an account, you can sync across multiple different mm -hmm. devices. Very similar to like iTunes, <laughs> but So for are these Android. pod catchers? These are pod catchers and pod players. OK. But so they're both I, in one. I just wanted to ask, I heard podcasting app, and I thought you were going to be like creating a podcast with an app on your Android device. No, I'm pretty sure he's asking about like how, okay. how to play these podcasts on your different things. Just check. <laughs> yeah, so this is the first one. I'll go ahead and pull it up on my computer. Pocket Casts. So when you pull it up, you'll notice that you get a whole bunch of different options. You have your, your main tile menu, and these are the ones that you have subscribed to. Uh, it also has Chromecast support, which is built in. There's this auto download feature and a bunch of different customizations that you can do. And the GUI is very, very easy to navigate around. And there are a ton of really great podcasts as well if you go to the Discover tab. So you can find all sorts of different ones that you might listen to. They have a whole bunch that are featured, trending, and then a bunch of different categories. Of course, if there's a specific one that you're looking for, you can also search for, th for those with the search button 
button at the top. And yes, Tech Thing and Hack 5 are both included in there. <laughs> because, duh. Duh. Yeah, and they do audio and video too. All of these do audio and video. So, Number two. Number two. So this one is called Beyond Pod Light. Uh, there's also a full version, but I'm going to focus on the light version. The pro version is $699. Mm -hmm. So the pro version lets you do Chromecast support, device syncing, and auto download features as well. So it works really, really good. But if we go over to Beyond Pod, this is what the GUI looks like. So it has a very healthy library of podcasts, but personally, I find it a little bit harder to navigate around the GUI because it's it's um, it's kind of pushed out of the way as far as your own personal podcasts go, and it was hard for me to figure out how to search for other ones that I wanted to discover. So it's not as easy to discover podcasts in Beyond Pod as it is in Pocket Casts, and that is one of its major negatives. Uh, but overall, it's pretty easy to use once you get used to the GUI. Mm -hmm. And if you can get used to it, I see no problem with, with using just the light version if you wanted to. So really if you don't need like the, the Chromecast support and auto download. So just the navig the clumsy navigation was really the only difficulty with it. Yeah, that okay. was the only like big thing for me. I was like, oh, this is kind of hard to get used to. Maybe you wouldn't like that. Uh, the third one is called Dog Catcher. This one is $2.99 and I, it's been around for a very, very long time. Uh, I don't like that it auto subscribes you to several different podcasts automatically when you download it. Right. It feels like favoritism to me, and since I am a podcaster, I don't really appreciate that. I like to have choices. I think it's charming <laughs> that you assume it's favoritism and not that somebody's paying to have their podcast they, automatically included. They might very well be paying. It, it was very uh, highly... Highly just vendor. Started. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so That's I don't listen help. to the ones that they had right. auto subscribe me to. Ooh, I'm flipping there. But <laughs> luckily, I was able to just delete those and then subscribe to the ones like I that I wanted to. This, by the way, is the actual application on the screen yes, right now. <laughs> that is. I love this. Thank you so much to our patron who recommended Visor app. This is amazing. Uh, so there are no syncing features in Dogcatcher, but it does have Chromecast support. It does have auto download, um, and it, the GUI is pretty easy to use. Uh, lastly, I also wanted to mention Podcast and Radio Addict. Uh, it's a good free option, but it does have ads, and you can get rid of those if you pay a little bit more, $2.99. Uh, it has most of the same features, plus you can add YouTube channels, which is really cool. So if cool. you look at my screen right here, you'll notice that I have my YouTube channel subscribed on here as well as my RSS feed. So I can go here and watch my YouTube shows and it watches them in app. And you can also watch podcasts right next to it. It does download them like every other one. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the YouTube thing is probably the coolest feature because it do does all of that in just one application. And I've never really seen that before. So Your props podcast. to podca pod Podcast and Radio Addict. The, all of the logos look the same. <laughs> is that your favorite? Um, my favorite is still Pocket Casts, mm -hmm. but I'm starting to lean towards Podcast and Radio Addict because of that YouTube feature. I think that's very, very cool, and I wish all of them had that. But it is missing some of the other things, like um, uh, like a decent GUI. <laughs> like Pocket Cast decent GUI. <laughs> So of course, what are your favorite picks? I know there are a lot of podcast and um, like RSS download catchers out there for Android mm -hmm. as well as iPhone. Let us know. You can always email me, ask at techthing.com. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not an air freshener. It is not a fancy <laughs> bottle of vodka. It is the Logitech Conference Cam. <laughs> it Shannon totally looks like an air freshener. Snubs Morris has the review. Well, okay. A lot of people spend a lot of time dealing with, with web conferences or net conferences or, oh, yeah. or video conferencing in an office environment. Mm -hmm. I think most of us have had atrocious experiences, especially from dedicated, incredibly expensive enterprise grade hardware. I hate those things. Well, yeah, it was, you know, the, the company, they spent eight grand like three years ago. It's just a state of the art. It won't make a call and nobody can hear anybody. Totally did, not state of the art. Did Logitech? <laughs> well, it was back in the day. Back in the day, not now. How does the connect? Is it good? Is it awesome? It's it's pretty cool. So it's basically three different things in one. It's a webcam speaker, mm -hmm. 
or a webcam, a Bluetooth speaker, and then it's a mirroring device with some really cool perks. And they better be cool because it's $499.99. So, so obviously it's not geared towards consumers, it's geared right. towards a small business owner who needs something that's easy to use, that they can just stick in a conference room and then it works. Okay. So this thing has 360 degree speakers, so there's oh, nice. speakers all the way around. There's a mic integrated on the back and the front so you can talk to people depending, right. no matter where you are at the table. Uh, HD tilting and panning camera on the inside with a 90 degree field of view and a four time zoom. And it's a Zeiss, uh, Carl Zeiss lens, which is nice. A little magnetic, yeah, magnetic remote goes <laughs> right on the front. And it's uh, very simple and it, obviously it runs off battery, so it's lit up. It's cool. Wow. So there are three different modes that you can choose from with this thing. Mm -hmm. The first one, of course, is video conferencing mode. So this is basically like a webcam mode. Uh, what I could do, I could use it with Google Hangouts, for okay. example. So I can use it on my computer, and the audio was very, very good when I tested this with one of my coworkers. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was able to see me just fine in HD, even on his right. terrible phone on our somewhat crappy connection. So we should point out, this is not a standalone device. You will need it is not. a computer or something yes. to make the connection to the yeah, conference. So I had to connect with the micro USB on the back mm -hmm. to my computer via USB and then call him on Hangouts. But this was working as the webcam instead of my integrating webcam. Right. And it was also working as the audio, too. So he was cool. able to hear me 360 degrees, even if I turned it around and he couldn't see me necessarily. Okay. So that's the first one. Bluetooth mode is the second one. Uh, this one basically lets you connect to your smartphone and use it as a Bluetooth speaker. Yay! <laughs> and again, the audio is really good for conversations, for listening to other people talk. How about for music? Is it sort of a, you know? That's the thing. Okay. So for music, not so good. It sounds kind of distorted when it gets louder. And you can even tell when you turn it on or off, mm -hmm. it sounds kind of muffled. So the the even the tone of that sounds a little bit muffled. So I wouldn't recommend it for just <laughs> playing music because it's not going to sound that great. <laughs> okay. The last one, and this is pretty cool, it's called the wireless screen mirror mode. So this lets you mirror your phone to an HDTV via a HDMI port on the back. And oh, if wow. I pick this up again, you'll see there's a full HDMI right down at the bottom. So that's really cool. You can just stick this into HDMI into, for example, the TV that we have back here. And then I can... Pre pretend this is in landscape pretend mode. Pretend it's in landscape mode. mode, yeah. And then I could just connect my uh, phone to this via mm -hmm. the, the wireless connection to this. And it will be able to screen share whatsoever, whatever is on my phone or my tablet. Now, just you, you can just use Android and Windows 8.1 plus phones or tablets. So I can't... It's kind of funny. I can, I can use it as a web conferencing device with my laptop, but yeah. I cannot screen mirror spreadsheets on my laptop yeah. to the Connect. Not unless you're doing it through okay. like Google Hangouts in that first mode that I mentioned. Got it. So you could do it through there, but not through the mirroring mode, which okay. is kind of weird. In the mirroring mode, am I actually using my phone to make the Hangout or the Skype or whatever the connection is? Yeah, okay. so you can either do that, or if you're just using it to mirror uh, out to somebody, okay. or if you you're just want to mirror like spreadsheets or Google Docs, uh -huh. that'll just be to whoever's in the room with you, Got if that it. makes sense. I think, no, it makes sense. So I had a little bit of issues with the mirroring mode, and uh, I'll pull up this dock for you. If I scroll down a little bit, it looks like they've just tested it with these phones and these tablets, which honestly is not that many since there's hundreds and hundreds of Android phones out, out there. So you would assume that it would work with most mm -hmm. of them. Uh, it completely failed trying to connect to my Nexus 6P. The 6P didn't even recognize right. it, even though it was able to find it for Bluetooth speaker. But the Nexus 5 was on the list. Why wouldn't the Nexus? Well, okay, the, so the, okay, the Nexus 6. No clue, but I used the Note 4, mm -hmm. and it was able to do Bluetooth and mirror mode just fine, and was, it worked flawlessly. Was the Note 4 on the list? The Note 4 was not, okay. but other Nexus Samsung 6. ones are. Okay. So they list Samsung Galaxy like 16 times. <laughs> Just kidding. There's four times. So <laughs> that one's on there, and so is the Nexus 4 and 5. So I would think, like, you know, it would work with both of them. But for some reason, it just did not connect to my 6P. Okay. Uh, so that was kind of an issue for me. Uh, but one of the cool things with mirror mode is if you're in landscape mode and mm -hmm. you're viewing your phone up and down like you normally would with a phone, mm -hmm. and you flip it so that it's also landscape, this will flip too. So you're oh, not, yes. you don't have a bunch of black bars on the, both of the sides of the screen. It'll actually give you a full screen, which cool. is great if you're watching stuff. Like, <laughs> 
podcasts. <laughs> and it's very, very smooth. There's a little bit of lag when it first like finds you know, you, whatever you're looking at. You can but pick up a Chromecast that's pretty good. for like 35 bucks instead of using a $500 video. I'm just saying. <laughs> And the audio plays through the TV instead of this. Oh, I would actually prefer this because the speakers on most TVs kind of suck. True. Yeah, I don't yeah. like them. So unless you have like a nice surround sound system set up in your conference room, it's not going to sound that great. So yes or no, it's a cool device. It works really well for the most part, but it's basically just combining like three different things that already exist. There's Bluetooth speakers that with NFC, and this does have NFC. There's USB webcams mm -hmm. with USB speakers, and then there's Chromecast, which has the same mirroring capability, but portability. I mean, you could run this thing for three hours in video mode or 15 with audio. So you could That's like do a cool. tour of the office. You could totally do that if you well, wanted to. at least if you connected it. Well, you'd still need to connect it to a device to run the application to do the web, so you'd yes. have to be carrying around your laptop. <laughs> yes, yes, you would, <laughs> which is kind of a stinker, but <laughs> it does have that portability, which is kind of cool. So it's great if you're a small business owner and you need an all-in-one answer, but, and this will do the job mm -hmm. for even people that are not so technical savvy, because anybody can use this right. thing, it's so easy. But on the other hand, it's probably out of a consumer's price range, especially since you can get all three of those different products that are built into this for much cheaper than 500 right. bucks. But that wouldn't be as easy for a conference room setting. So if somebody wants an all-in-one... There By the way, the that's the Android, Android. again. <laughs> So if somebody wants an all-in-one device that'll handle everything and is cheaper than what you can generally get in a business setting, right. this is great. It's going to work great. But if you're a consumer, nah, I'd say just buy a Chromecast. <laughs> and a webcam. <laughs> and a webcam. And a USB speaker. They do have great Logitech HD webcams. So there's that. What's the biggest problem with technology you have in your office or your house? We want to know. Send us an email, askatechthing.com or tweet at techthing. Or hey, you can go on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash techthing. See you there. Jeremy writes in, Shannon and Patrick, when you guys were at Techzilla, Shannon mentioned a site you can go to and type your email in and see what sites you've signed up for with that email. What was that site called? Oh, Jeremy. Hmm. I'm so glad you asked. So I kind of don't remember, but <laughs> I was able to find them again. <laughs> the first one's called NameCheck. That's namechk.com. So you can go here and you can type in your username. Like my username is usually Snurbs. So I'll type that in, scroll down to usernames, and it'll block out any that it's already taken on, like Twitter, duh. It, I have twitter.com slash snubs. Uh, Google Plus is available because I use my real name on Google Plus. So you can go through here and see which sites have already registered with your username. Uh, you can use email as well or other um, names that you can think of, like your real name. And then after that, you can go to Just Delete Me, and you can search for a specific site. So if you found out that you're on Twitter and you don't want to have your Twitter account anymore, find Twitter, and then it'll link you directly to the info on how to deactivate your account. So your Whoa. account is deactivated, whoop, there we go, bef uh, before being deleted, after 30 days of remaining deactivated, it will then be deleted. So you don't necessarily have to contact anybody to delete your account there, but some you do, and on those, it links you directly to the source. Oh my pretty cool. That's pretty it's awesome. Great for security. And we got an email from <laughs> Ken who says at askattechthing.com, how can you set the amp camp amp on the table in front of you and not discuss it? How does it sound? What kind of preamp is required? How does it compare to the other amps from DIY Audio from Ken in Portland, Oregon? I agree. Okay, so this, ladies and gentlemen, is the Amp Camp Amp, AKA, holy crap, I built an amplifier with my own two hands <laughs> and Snubs' hands for the first one and then the second yeah. one. Well, it's funny, the first one you helped and the second one, it was like, I'm finishing this amp. Yeah. And it was like two in the morning when I wrapped up with it. <laughs> um, so yeah, holy crap, I built an amp. If you're a patron, you have access to the full build video. Um, to answer your questions, one, it sounds really good. Um, it's low power, it's like five or six watts. Um, it's class A amp. Um, so it's it's got that whole class A you know single ended push. It's just I don't want to get I don't want to get in the weeds on amp topology yet. Um, <laughs> so you know they recommend like 90 dB or better speakers. They're a really good idea if you want kind of volume on them. Uh, 95 dB or better would be super awesome, but those are kind of rare. Uh, incredibly low noise floor by my standards. Silent when music isn't playing. Uh, uh, maybe realize I need to get rid of one of my older amps because it has a lot of, of noise. Oh. Uh, I just realized how much I hate noise. I've mostly <laughs> been running uh, these amps. There's two of them. They call like monoblocks, which is two single channel amps, hence no crossover uh, on the uh, 
audio between them. Uh, my long-suffering B&W 601s and a pair of vintage Clips Heresies I got cheap from a friend, which get really loud because they're really efficient. I like the 601s a lot. Um, the Heresies, the high end's a little crispy. Mm. Uh, number two, I don't use preamps much anymore. I've been feeding my amps from an AudioQuest Dragonfly, uh, JDS Labs Element, various USB DACs yeah. off of Volumio boxes uh, built on a Raspberry Pi. All of them sound really, really good. So. Uh, it doesn't seem to be particularly picky about what you match it with. That's cool. Or maybe I'm doing it wrong and I'm not hearing the Class A audiophile magic because I haven't found a $4,000 amp for the $4,000 <laughs> preamp uh, for the uh, for the amps I built. But they have preamp uh, boards if you want to build your own preamp uh, on DIY Audio. Cool. So the Amp Camp amp compared it to other stuff on DIY Audio. DIY Audio is a website for uh, audio enthusiasts who make their own stuff. Um, the DIY audio store mostly sells stuff like, hey, look, there's preamplifiers. Um, the Amp Camp amp, these are all preamplifier boards. Um, the thing about the Amp Camp amp is it is designed for noobs, for first time builders like me. So it's A, simpler than most of the amps from DIY audio, and B, they ship a complete kit. So you've got all of the boards you need, uh, the power amplifiers, the capacitors, resistors. They use um, PC, actually, uh, laptop power supplies. <laughs> and there's enclosures. Um, the laptop power supplies, A, simplify the construction, and B, make it much less likely that anybody's going to electrocute themselves oh, yeah. while putting together a power supply. Um, they were really easy to build. I think, you know, uh, you know, I think probably 12 hours between the two of them, and we yeah. were shooting video during the first one, which makes everything run 80% slower than it needs to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, man, you know, sound-wise, I think they're great. Um, I'm also to the point where, you know, you know, class A, class AB, class D. It's all about a well-designed, well-put-together amp more mm. so than the actual amp topology. Uh, I'm not throwing out my other amps and replacing them with class A amps just yet. And that brings us to Michael, who also writes, quick question to Patrick. I watched your review of the ELAC bookshelf speakers and interview with Andrew Jones and really liked the idea of a quality sub 500 speaker. Me too. So I went and <laughs> ordered a set of the B5s. Now I'm looking for a small form factor, single or dual input analog or optical amplifier with headphone out as well to pair with these awesome little speakers. I've looked at the FIO A1 Mini 2 times 14 watt Class D digital audio amplifier on Amazon. It seems to get good reviews, but I'm a little reluctant to go Class D for the amp from Michael. Okay. So, mm. first of all, one, thanks for the trust. If you haven't seen it, uh, this is the ELAC UB5. Uh, Andrew Jones started out at KEF and then made Moonshot, $65,000 pair of speakers for a company called TAD, and then made some of the best inexpensive speakers ever made for Pioneer. And uh, when Pioneer decided to stop doing home audio, he ended up uh, with... Uh, working for this, this German company called ELAC, uh, coming up with super inexpensive uh, speaker designs. He did the debut last year. Um, you know, anything designed by Andrew Jones should be pretty awesome. The debut speakers that came out uh, last year, which you are not looking at at the moment, uh, were $280 a pair for bookshelf speakers, were a lot of the best of lists for 2015. Second thing, don't discount Class D amplifiers. Uh, my big lesson from the Amp Camp amp is that good amp design is good amp design. Most audiophile amps are Class AB. A lot of the expensive ones, yes, are Class A. Uh, and in the few years, though, Class D has come on strong. Uh, in Class D, so Class D is essentially a switching amplifier. Class A is applying full power across the entire arc of the audio curve. Uh, class AB is basically you know, the, the whole, there's like a 360 degree for the wave cycle for audio. And class A, it basically has the, is, is consuming, it's inefficient. It, it, it sends all of the power through the entire cycle. They tried to do class B, except it sounded really odd. So they came up with class AB, which is a mixture of A and B, which is what most audiophile amps are. And it's much, much more efficient than a class A amplifier and delivers really good sound. Class D is basically a transistorized amp. Some people call them digital amps, but it's actually just the next letter in the, amplif uh, the amplifier universe. Mm -hmm. um, um, so although some class D amps are digital, Class D doesn't mean digital. In the past few years, they've started showing up in amps that cost thousands of dollars that are marketed at people with a lot of money to spend, um, in part thanks to ICE Power Modules, which started as a graduate's thesis, uh, which was kind of picked up by Bang & Olufsen, which then spun off the company as ICE Power. Their modules are showing up everywhere, uh, Hypex, um, uh, class T amps, which the the the, tri or the, the class T amps, which are, are that processor that design for the for the mm. is now owned by TI. Uh, New Force is another one that started out. They came up with their own uh, amplifier design, class D amplifier design. They're now owned by Oppo, which makes some of the best high-end audiophile headphones on the planet. Um, 
Class D amplifiers are showing up in everything from $25 lapai amps to wow. audiophile companies that charge thousands. Uh, if you have a Bluetooth speaker that sounds amazing, you're listening to a Class D amp. Uh, ELAC is building a pretty sick integrated uh, amp slash DAC that's going to cost around 600 though. Uh, Emotiva is coming out with a new entry level amp that should be around 200, 250 bucks. NAD has some great stuff under $400. The 316B and the uh, 3020D would be uh, notable ones. Uh, the Audiophiliac over at CNET has uh, some really great things to say about Dayton Audio. He did a great article, a $160 system an audiophile could love. Um, and that's using uh, this uh, Dayton amplifier, the APA 100, two input stereo amplifier, 60 watts per channel, which will get those speakers plenty loud. Uh, and that sells for about 100 bucks on Amazon and other places. Trust your ears. Don't look for audiophile checks boxes. You know, just look for good specs. If it's got clean power and there's no crossover between the two channels, it should sound really, really good. All right. So. I think I'm ready to put down my phone and step away from my computer for a bit. Is it time? I think it is time <laughs> for us to remember to do something analog because doing something analog and actually going outside into the sun, sun, sunlight is very important. Or you could do something like Walt's pick. <laughs> he is building a Stormtrooper costume. He said, awesome. I recently took the leap and bought a Stormtrooper armor kit from Anovos and have been building it as screen accurate as possible. Nice. This is the latest picture. Working on the legs next, hoping to have it done before free comic book day in May. Thanks for the show from Walt in New Jersey. And I gotta say, thank you for being a patron. And that is one of the coolest costumes I have seen lately. That's yeah, pretty it looks awesome. looks amazing. Good New job. Star Wars movie available uh, on Blu-ray April 5th. Yay! It's gonna be showing so up. Excited. Uh, Go Ray! See, apparently it's gonna be start streaming like April 1st on Amazon. Not that you're gonna Yay! <laughs> I'm so excited! I love Ray. I want her to be my best friend. <laughs> no spoilers, I'm say. I'm Shannon Morse. I'm Patty Norton. We'll see you next week on Tech. Recording. Just kidding. That was <laughs> so upsetting. I did actually have the Odroid on set. Oh, I forgot to mention I'm going to Japan in May. Check my Twitter you for dates. You mentioned that like every show. <laughs> You're excited. Yes. I'm going to host a meetup. <gasps> Officially? On May 23rd at a place in Ueno called Hopple Popple. Hopple Popple. Yes, it's a pub. <laughs> it's in Tokyo. Ueno. Like a costume pub or just like near. a place where you drink beer? It's on the, it's north of central Tokyo. Yay! Meet up! Woo! I can't wait for the big giant box of Aki to show up. Oh, dude. It'll be the big giant okay. box full of like cosplay gear. I'm gonna like walk like, around there with. Box full I don't of, know. Like, do they? Do, I wonder. Do, I'm assuming they have shopping carts in Tokyo, but maybe not. I don't know. <laughs>